Okay, I'm here now. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order for the city of Saratoga Springs, uh, Tuesday, June 2nd, uh, 2020 at 6.03 p.m. Um, <clears throat> Meetings are being streamed electronically um, in accordance with COVID regulations. Uh, call to order tonight. Uh, we have roll call. We have Councilman Wilden, Councilman Porter, Councilman Karn. Um, Councilman McComber's asked to be excused and Councilman Podeska. So we have a quorum tonight. Uh, Mark, any ongoing items? Uh, no, Mayor and Council, we do have a uh, need for a closed session later this evening uh, or at the, at, at the, towards the end of the meeting. Um, we do have obviously um, some interesting stuff happening just relative to, uh, you know, kind of the, the COVID response, but we can talk about that later on. Okay. And then I will move to the public hearings. Uh, first up, we have the Saratoga Springs Transportation Impact Fee Facilities Plan. IFFP hey, and impact Mayor? fee analysis. Mayor? Yeah. Am I, am I missing something? Do we do the invocation pledge? Oh, you are right. I'm streamlining this thing, Chris. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. We'll do our invocation by Councilman Wilden and uh, our pledge by uh, Assistant City Manager Owen Jackson. Thank you. Our Father in Heaven, we're grateful this day and we're grateful that we're able to meet together uh, virtually as a city council and evaluate things for our city. And we ask you to bless our, our residents and our staff and all those across the nation with the things that they're in need of and, and with peace. And we ask you to bless us as a community. We'll be able to come together and support one another and make good decisions that will improve the life of all around us. And these things we say in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Will everyone arise and repeat the pledge with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And thank you, Chris. So we will now move to the public hearings. Uh, sorry, Mayor. I'm going to interrupt you Mayor, again if I can. Uh, council reports. <laughs> if I could, I'd like to bring up a topic on Perfect. council reports. Perfect. So it, it's come to my attention recently um, of a uh, maybe a require maybe a change in our code as it pertains to food truck use in residential zones. I did send an email to the council and mayor last week. Um, if I can get support of a couple more council members, I'd like to review the code and look at maybe making some updates to it. Um, not to necessarily make residential zones a free for all for food truck and food truck services, but to open the possibility for when people want to hire a food truck to cater a private event that takes place at someone's house in a residential zone to allow that to happen. Um, so I think it would require some, some change to our code. And if I can get the support of a couple other council members, um, I'd like to get that reviewed and the process started. Uh, I'm fine if they want to bring, staff wants to bring us something to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had mentioned in the emails that I support that as well. Uh, if I can, thank you. If I can add, um, so internally as staff, we have been talking about this, and we are currently just, you know, reviewing everything, making sure everything jives with what we currently have, um, and and looking at some of those options. So um, we've already kind of started um, this process a little bit, and um, now that we've got that direction, we can put something together and bring it to you. Mayor and Council, Thanks, dude. as you know, this will um, this will be something that we'll take to the Planning Commission. They would make a recommendation, and then we would bring it back to you all. So it will be at least a couple of weeks before we'll get this back to you, but we'll start working towards that. Um, if I can, is there is there any, uh, just as far as relaxing it, so allowing food trucks a couple of times a year per residence, no ongoing operations, 
And uh, I'm assuming that we'd want the truck entirely on private property so it's not blocking sidewalks, things of that nature. Um, and then um, is there anything else that you as a council would be um, wanting us to make sure that we include in that? Um, I think just, oh, Mark. go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Chris. No, go ahead. Um, I, I think kind of what, similar to what was said earlier, the, the my main concern is making sure that it doesn't become something where the food truck is just going into a residential neighborhood and setting up shop. Uh, I, I, I want to make sure that the protection is, and the idea is, is that the residents are the ones that are bringing the food truck to the location um, at their request. And so whether it requires a permit or a special per, special event permit or something like that, um, you know, I, I think I, I would be... I would be open. I think in most cases it needs to be on private property. I think if they're doing something where they're already shutting down a road or something that they would have to file a permit for or something like that, then in that case it might be allowed. Um, but we don't want it on a road that's still being used, I don't think, just because it, then you have traffic issues. Yeah. Okay. And, and Mark, at the same time, I know we discussed this, but what I don't want to see is uh, food trucks residents who own food truck services setting up a permanent restaurant in a food truck or driveway. That's not the intent of what I'm going for. I want to be able to, I don't see the difference between somebody hiring a caterer to cater a private party at their house and someone hiring a food truck to cater a party at their house. I think we need to have some flexibility to allow that type of use. And at the same time, not allow food trucks to set up in front of people's homes uh, ad hoc and just um, open open restaurants, you know, around the city. Okay. All right, so I'm hearing, Chris, that you wanna preserve the um, no restaurant uses in residential areas uh, long-term, uh, but but only for short-term short, short -term kind of an event. Yeah, and I, you know, hopefully you can come back with some, some verbiage that makes sense, but I think you get the spirit of what I'm going towards. If someone is having a graduation party and they wanna hire, uh, you know, one of our local food trucks, Sean Smokehouse, to cater that event, um, and they have a food truck to do it. I, I think we should be able to allow for that. At the same time, not have a food truck who finds a beneficial area to set up, you know, every Tuesday night and and uh, have sell food out of the residential zone. Okay. Fantastic. Mayor Council, thank you. That, that gave us Great feedback. If you think of anything else, please uh, please email myself uh, and then uh, uh, CC David Johnson um, on that, and we'll we'll work with planning and, and take that to the planning commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect. Any other reports? No, I won't interrupt you anymore. No, nope. that's fine. We have a meeting with communities of care tomorrow. Um, Councilman Porter is going to attend that uh, for the city. Um, so we'll have more information when he gets back from that. Mayor, if I could. Look at that uh, excitement on his face. <laughs> Ken uh, Mark? Mayor, if I could, and I apologize earlier when you asked me this question, I was kind of thinking we were still pre-meeting, so my apologies. I did have one question for you, and it really is, is for you as a council. Um, it, it's really related to the COVID policy. Um, as, as you know, as a council, we uh, suspended late payments and we suspended uh, penalties accruing uh, during the initial phases of COVID, kind of following suit with a lot of other utilities. Um, my question for you, bills have already gone out for this month. So for June, there's been no late penalties, there's been no late fees. What, my question to you would be, how do you feel uh, as far as how long we continue this process? Are you comfortable if we, we make the announcement and then basically it means that people would have, in July, we would start assessing penalties and, 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 and fees, um, kind of going back to our old policy. We've just suspended it for the COVID or would you like us to continue to offer this, um, I'll call it a forgiveness policy at this point um, due to the COVID response. Um, where we're, we're to yellow, where we're, we're probably going to be moving to green at some point in the near future. Do you want us to continue to wait and to, to change that policy? Or would you prefer us to, effective July, start assessing late fees and penalties? What, what are your thoughts relative to that? Uh, 
Um, I'll 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 go first, I guess, since nobody else is jumping on it. Um, I I brought this up uh, slightly to Mark just because um, we had, we've had some friends and as well as my wife has mentioned to me that at least at the library, we're not seeing a lot of circulation of materials because people that had them before COVID are just hanging on to them. So I mentioned maybe maybe we should look at you know starting to try and get get books turned turned over again. Um, I'm uh, willing to look at uh, at reinstituting uh, late fees. Um, maybe we we it sounds the announcement I just saw on my phone it sounds like the state may be going green here in the next week or so. Um, maybe when we go green, we put out that announcement and, and reinstitute the late fees. I, I want us to, given that so many people are still out of work um, temporarily, I think I, I would like to continue the moratorium on shutoffs a little longer than perhaps the late fees. Um, but that's kind of where my brain's at right now. Okay, and if I could, I'll just give a little bit more background and I'm gonna speak generally. Um, we have a, about, you know, uh, about a thousand accounts, maybe 1500 accounts that they've just stopped making payments on their accounts, whether it's COVID related or not, I don't know. Um, we, we don't know. However, um, where we've just kind of got an indefinite period where there's no accountability, there's no requirement for them to pay or, or, or consequence to not paying. The question becomes at some point, we're going to have to transition back. And, and our recommendation would be that we stick with the policy that we had in place, which was they get notice, um, you know, they, they then after, you know, we would start the clock now, but basically if we started that clock now, um, we would be looking at the end of July would be the soonest we'd start doing shutoffs for people if they still haven't gotten their account current by that point. Is it current or they're at least on some type of payment plan? So if you remember several years ago, we got rid of the, the payment plan concept um, and we've worked with people to get those removed. So again, we, we in a COVID response, we, we, we took the action to, to mirror what other utility companies are doing. Um, but again, it's, it's really the question of at what point do we start the clock so that those that are just not paying their bills because it's an interest-free way that they don't pay their bills versus those that are truly impacted by COVID that are, that are wanting uh, or needing some sort of assistance. Again, if we do wanna go on payment plans, I would also like your recommendation as to how long those payment plans would last or what we would work with people on. Again, I'm bringing this up more just for us to start the dialogue. I don't, that's, you know, I don't need a decision tonight, but if, if we're looking towards uh, an end of July thing, at some point we're gonna need to make that, that decision and start making it a very public conversation. Well, I can I go mayor? Is that all right? Yep. I would say I'm supportive of restarting it at, at some type of level because the unemployment is not 1,500 homes out of the city. So, um, and that's factual. So there's a number of people that are just taking advantage of it. I, I think we need to, not that I want to get in the payment plan business, but I think it would be something at least considering with some parameters, if certain people could demonstrate that they were like directly impacted by COVID layoffs or those type of things. I, I know that's probably puts the city in an awkward position, but I, I think personally that could be the right thing to do, but I am in favor as soon as the state goes green, reinstituting this um, is Unfortunately, I think there's some bad actors out there that are taking advantage of an interest-free loan, which is not what it was designed to do. So, but I don't want to punish those other people that it was intended for. Okay. Um, and and again, where we where we transition out of having payment plans, I would suggest that that we basically um, we work with them, but it would probably need to be a really a short-term work with them rather than. A six six months or something. Again, some people just stopped paying their bills um, when they got wind that there was no penalties or there are no shutoff penalties. And those are the people that we really probably need to transition back towards, you know, keeping current with their bills and things of that nature. So if, if I, I'm hearing the direction is is when the state turns green, uh, we make we make that the policy decision and that's the trigger. And then it would be the next billing cycle after that. Yes, I agree with that. Good. Can, can I say if the state doesn't go green, um, 
I think we still ought to revisit this um, every, maybe every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's too much, but because <laughs> the state may get uber cautious on changing it to green because the numbers have been increasing or whatever. I, I, I like triggering it to green, but also evaluating it every two weeks so that we're not tied to perhaps someone else's political agenda. Okay, so I'll put a utility billing follow up uh, on the next council meeting under admin reports. I, I and that was only me. I don't know if everyone, the mayor and everyone else is good with that, but I, I'm okay with that. Okay my, with my, my, uh, my concern, I guess, is if we're going to start shut offs, then we need to have some sort of means where people that are, uh, that were ab adversely affected can e either by proving it or by getting on a payment plan or something like that, that, that should allow them to stay, stay connected. I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't necessarily want to go full bore back to where we were prior to this, realizing that not everybody's situation. I think we need to be understanding of those that, that were affected. Um, and so if we can, if they get on a payment plan, then we won't shut them off. And if they don't, then then we can use our normal policy. Okay. Right. It, it, and maybe I'm more aggressive is if they can't prove that they weren't impacted, I'm not interested in putting them on a payment plan. I, I just don't know how we do that. I mean, I'm sure that they can show an unemployment filing or something like that, but I, I don't know yep. what, how much information we want to get in the business of gathering. If, if we're, if everybody else is comfortable with that, that's fine. I just, I'd look to staff. I don't know. Right. Okay. I will work on that over the next two weeks and come back with uh, more of a, uh, a strategy on that. Again, I just wanted to get your general feelings about how do we transition back to that? Um, again, it was an immediate action that we took in order to try and show compassion to our, our residents that are impacted. We certainly see that as a huge need, and I, I think it was very, uh, very much the right policy that you, as a council, um, you know, put into place. It's the it's the question of how do we transition back towards that. And so, again, um, you know, I appreciate your trusting us and, and allowing us to work on that. We'll bring you something next week, next council meeting. And Mayor, uh, that concludes the, the item. For that. Or administrative discussion. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. The, the public hearing for the transportation fee impact. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So uh, some time ago, um, several months ago, we, we uh, completed the transportation master plan and the council adopted that. And we've been working on the impact fee facilities plan. Since then, uh, we've identified projects and we've calculated the fees. I've got the two consultants uh, with us tonight. Um, uh, Kevin Croshaw of Horrocks Engineers who did the impact fee facilities plan and Susie Becker of Zions Bank who did the impact fee analysis. Uh, they have a brief ex explanation of what, what they did. And uh, so uh, uh, had the time over to Kevin Croshaw, who can give a brief explanation of what he did and then go straight over to Susie Becker. And then uh, uh, however you wanna handle it after that, uh, Mayor. Okay, yeah, after we hear from them, then we can open up the public hearing and then go back to the council. Okay, thanks, Gordon. Uh, Mayor Council, it's good to, to be here again. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And we'll, uh, I just have one brief slide here. Um, just kind of go over um, what we did as part of the updating the impact fee facilities plan. Um, so just as an introduction, uh, the purpose of the impact fee facilities plan is uh, to determine the proportion of new development uh, trips that can be attributed to each uh, project included in the impact fee. Um, so uh, included in the impact fee, uh, there are certain reductions that we can't charge for, for new development. Uh, those are pass-through trips, excess capacity, existing deficiencies, and existing user share. Uh, so uh, pass-through traffic are trips that uh, do not originate or have a destination within Saratoga Springs. Um, 
and then excess capacity, knowing that the city is planning for, for uh, you know, the future beyond the, these impact fee projects, um, there's just some of that capacity that won't be used up. And so we cannot attribute the impact fees uh, for, for that extra capacity in the roadways. Um, existing deficiencies. So any road that's above capacity today, uh, we cannot attribute new development to fix any of those problems that we see on the roads today. And then lastly, existing user share. Um, these are existing vehicles that may not use some of these roads today, maybe due to traffic or um, that will, because of the project, will now transition and use this new road. Now, an example would be recently Pony Express was widened, you know, and so due to traffic, maybe there's new, because the road is now widened, new trips. Um, people who use the existing network use that roadway uh, to, because now there's less traffic. Um, so in the impact fee facilities plan, the total project cost, as you can see, is 65838000 And of that, 26208000 is eligible for uh, impact fee expenditure. And then uh, this, this impact fee period is going to generate a total new development trips of 15,000. Uh, 101 trips. And so this data and information is then passed on to Susie Becker. We pass it on to Susie Becker Zions, who was able to uh, uh, calculate the, the impact fee. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn the time over to Susie. And I'll stop sharing my screen here. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. I'm going to share my screen for just a moment. See. Yeah. Okay, can you see that? Um, we'll just pick up right where Kevin left off. Kevin um, put together the engineering um, technical document, the impact fee facilities plan which identified the costs created by new development and the trips, the demand that um, was generating the need for those facilities. And then my job in the impact fee analysis is to proportionately share those costs amongst new development. So taking um, the cost for the new construction, the 26 million Kevin just showed you, plus we had a little bit of excess capacity where new development could buy in to 2.596 million Take those costs, divide them by the growth in trips, 15,101 trips. We have a little bit of adjustment there. We can add in consultant costs. We can um, allocate a little bit. We had a little bit of um, impact fee fund balance that could be used to help offset these costs. And we come up with a cost per trip. So that is step one. There are two steps in an impact fee analysis. The next step is to then say, when someone comes in to pay their impact fee, well, how many trips um, will they generate based on their type of development? So in order to identify the number of trips they generate, so we can multiply it by the number, by the cost per trip, we turn to the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the ITE trip generation manual. It's the Bible for um, these, um, for the number of trips generated by development type. And so you look up whether it's retail, industrial, movie theater, school, single family residential, multifamily residential, whatever it is, it will give you the number of PM peak hour trips, which is how our fee has been calculated. Um, it will, um, we have to adjust it by 50% to match Kevin's model. Um, all the engineers it seem to have the MAG models, WASA, Trump models, all of those, um, have a 50% reduction so we don't count back and forth over the driveway because we go in and out as two trips rather than one. So we just um, reduce the trips in ITE by 50%. And we also um, make a small adjustment for pass by trips. Um, that's different than pass through. Pass through trips Kevin talked about are people going through our community. Pass by is when you combine several um, errands at once when you go to the grocery store and you pick the, you pick the kids up from school or in, you know, you've gone and uh, stopped at the bank or whatever it may be. So those are all numbers that are provided and, and we can footnote source right to the ITE uh, manual. 
So we'll multiply the number of trips. So let's use an example. Single family residential has 0.99 PM peak hour trips per day times 50% reduction. Um, it doesn't have um, a pass by reduction like some categories do. So we just multiply it times the cost per trip and we get a cost of $872 per single family residential unit. That's, uh, there's a big spreadsheet uh, as you've, if you've looked at the um, impact fee analysis report there where you can see the different um, cost uh, maximum fees that you can charge for different development types. So that's how we take the Kevin, Kevin's information from the IFFP and come up with the maximum impact fee that you can charge. Any questions? I I had one the the which may I ask it Jim I you guess I, um, what we're proposing now I didn't see it in the materials maybe it's there and I, I just missed it um, but what is what we're proposing compared to how it is today um we have that I don't know if I know that right off um, I don't know if Mark knows. It went down a couple hundred bucks or 250 bucks, something like that. Um, I can, uh, I can find that real quick. Yeah, um, I had that too. No, I, I'm confident in the math, but if we're going down, um, I think it'd be worth really going back and looking at some of the engineering cost estimates to make sure it includes all the consulting costs, the uh, rate of inflation and other things that may attribute to these. Um, it, it just, from my standpoint, it just seems strange that impact fees would be going down when the entire community, and I know there's a lot of factors into it, but when the entire uh, community can see the impact every time a new development's brought on. Okay, so the number uh, the number that it is right now is eleven hundred and twenty five dollars. Um, so I don't want to step over uh, Susie or or the others, but the, the most obvious reason is uh, the project list changed, and uh, um, it, it's that simple. the The list of projects that we ha had identified in the last one is different than uh, from this one. So is that eleven hundred? Uh, dollar figure that you just gave Gordon is that for a single family residential or is that the per trip value? No, that's the single family residential. So that's okay. compared to the 870. 872. Okay. Yes. Now, Mayor and Council, just so you're aware, we're constantly in the flux of updating our impact fees and doing these studies. This particular update, we're, we're going down. Um, we have the application in for the MAG grant for Foothill Boulevard. Quite frankly, this year, we were hoping that we would have already gotten all of that MAG funding numbers. Um, but depending on whether or not that project gets MAG funding or not, will probably have a fairly significant impact on, on the next update. And I, su I, su I submit to you that, you know, at some point in the not too distant future, when we know that number, we'll probably be doing some sort of another update, you know, within the next six to, to 12 months, um, depending on what that looks like. Again, Assuming the MAG funding, that, that, would, that would be a big project that's not necessarily going to impact be related. Um, if we don't get funding, you, you know we're going to be having the conversation about a $15 million project that will probably drive this, this number up again. Again, we're just in flux on some of the grant uh, projects that we've, we've asked for. And so like, for example, uh, Pony Express, we're thrilled to be building the extension of Pony Express next year. However, it's MAG funded. So our proportionate share is a few hundred thousand dollars relative to the, the, you know, the many, many millions of dollars that will cost us that project. So it's the nature of the developers are building the projects and they're, they're, they're building the projects or, um, you know, we're just not, we're not planning on building a lot of road projects, um, you know, today, six months from now, a year from now, that could change based on what our grant applications look like. Well, should we make the presumption that we don't get grants? Um, well, we would have to then turn around and do an impact fee study and reduce the, the funding um, either way. So it, it's one of those things that we update our fees uh, often enough. And as you know, we update our TMP every several months when a developer comes in. These are all things that are very important. But as of the analysis today, this is what we feel is the right number. And that number will 
probably go up in the future, but for now, um, we would recommend the, the number that this current study shows. Okay. So, this, so this is an opportunity to talk about the common uh, perception that, uh, or the, the, the temptation to compare impact fees uh, with other cities. And uh, the reality is that impact fees are unique to each city and they're unique to that list of projects. So uh, no other city has a project list like ours. And, uh, and as Mark indicated, that project list is, is changing often and we're trying to change with it. Well, and I can support this, you know, and I'll support staff's recommendation. I would just suggest maybe in the next update, whenever that may be, that let's presume that we don't get grant money when we're trying to calculate that type of stuff in, because then if we don't get the grant money, then we have to go back in and do it. Whoever came in um, and got those impact fees paid during that time frame when uh, that we had lowered it, they didn't pay for their proportionate share one way or another. So I, right. that would just be an assumption that I would recommend in the future is let's not rec let's not place reliance on other governmental entities funding things. I don't disagree. Unfortunately, though, if we do get the grant, then we have to refund the fees to those people that have paid. And so if the double edged honestly righteous on impact fee law and and uh, you know at this point we feel like this is a, a good strategy and again you know the next iteration it will probably go up is my guess no and that's fine i'm supportive i'd just be rather rather be in the position of having to give back some credits versus trying to collect something because if it goes up we're never going to go back and collect it yep thank you mayor Council. yeah so mark that was my question if, if we if we did a study with no assumed grants do we have to give credits or or rebate developers when grants do come in yes we do and and that that's okay. it's just flat out we have to refund it and and you know i use foothill as an example because um, we're looking at multiple funding sources for that that's not just i mean if we don't get it through mag we're going to look to see if we can get udot to fund it so we're we're looking at multiple sources for that because Again, if we look at that project um, as if it's the I-15 corridor, literally from Lehigh down to Orem, that's in essence what Foothill Boulevard is gonna ultimately look like someday. And sure, we're only talking right now about the first two, three lanes of that road, um, but, but fundamentally we're talking about building a freeway network that at, at, the, you know, at, at some point in the future, and this is where I get romanticizing infrastructure, so I apologize, but, but this is where we're talking about really uh, I-15 corridor from, from Lehigh to Orem. And we feel that that has enough regional significance that it's likely to get funded through grants. And so again, in this particular round, it's probably well worth it to be conservative. And hey, um, you know that's just the nature of it. I agree, we wanna make people pay for their proportionate share, but if we, if we can't prove it, then we shouldn't be charging it. Fair enough. Okay. We'll open the public hearing portion of this now. Is there anybody from the public or any comments sent in from the public? Uh, Mayor, I didn't see any comments come through and we don't have any attendees registered. I will say that I forwarded an email to you earlier from Deanne Hewish from the Utah Valley Home Builders Association. And so, um, hopefully, we can have a look at that particular email. It was appreciated our proactive efforts in impact fee analysis. Okay, perfect. Now, I'll close the public hearing at this time and entertain a motion. May I move we approve the Certo Springs Transportation Impact Fee Facilities Plan and Impact Fee Analysis Update Ordinance 2020, dated 6 220. Second. Okay, I have a first from Councilman Carr and a second from Councilman Porter. Any further discussion on the motion? Podesca? Aye. Porter? Aye. Carn? Aye. Wilden? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. We have the firework restrictions update.
So mayor and council. Oh, Jess, uh, oh, Jess, there, there we go. Go ahead, Jess. Oh yeah, I'm I'm here, but you're feel free to uh, uh, put your legalese on the, on in on this. Oh, you're fine. It's this oh. is your item, so go ahead. I I was going to cover for you, but I'll oh. I'll defer to you. I appreciate that. So, uh, Mayor and Council, this is this is just our effort to or our opportunity to update um, our, our ordinance uh, with the restrictions that we've that we've had in the past, uh, specifically the periphery streets. Um, we this is our opportunity to update that map, to submit it to both the county and the state. Uh, and update it with the development and the things that have taken place as as that periphery continues to expand and um, just want to make sure that we've uh, done what we can to address uh, our, our, um, our our interface issues okay any questions for the chief then i'll entertain a motion I will move that we approve business item one, ordinance 20-21 dated today. I'll second. Yeah, but first from Councilman Wilden, a second Councilman Podeska. Any further discussion on the motion? Councilman Karn? Aye. Porter? Aye. Podeska? Aye. Wilden? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. We have the minutes from May 19th, 2020. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the minutes. I have a first second. from Councilman Porter, second from Councilman Karn. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, Mark. Oh, the, the next item, sorry. Okay. Then we have a uh, need to enter into closed session. I'll entertain a motion for closed oh, session. There before yeah. we. I apologize. There was something I missed on an administrative reports, and I apologize. Would the council grant me an indulgence to circle back on an item? Yes. <laughs> I guess. I missed enough stuff today, Mark. You're good. All right. Hey, thanks, Mayor. Um, I forgot. I uh, We had our, our, our coordinating meeting with Lehigh City earlier today. Uh, this is the staff meeting that you as a council have directed us to do. It went fantastic. We've got some great, uh, great coordinating things going on. Um, we last last year, if you recall, we went and spoke with the Lehigh City Council and Mayor about uh, participating with us on the North Marina, and uh, they they expressed some interest. And you know, due to COVID, things just got a little bit crazy, and we just really haven't had a chance to circle back. In talking with Jason Walker with Lehigh, he proposed um, that if you as a council would like, we could get together on July seventh and actually do a site visit to the North Marina Park. And uh, in the past, you've requested that we actually schedule kind of a dinner with them. If, if you're comfortable with this and if that date works, what I would propose is that we invite them to come join us, do a, a joint work session with them at the North Marina site. And we would actually just bring in a catered dinner for, for the councils uh, to, to enjoy that. Uh, obviously, if, uh, if the public wanted to come, they would certainly be welcome to, to come. And, uh, and, and you know, walk the site with us. Uh, but again, uh, it, it was just a, a thought that, that came out and we wanted to see, it kind of kills two birds with one stone uh, where we would be discussing the North Marina and some coordinated efforts that we could do with them. Obviously we'd have an agenda with them on some of the other items, but uh, we felt like it also met the intent of what you've asked us to do, which is let's look for a social opportunity to be able to get with them and, 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 and strengthen our relationship as communities. What's the date on that one? Uh, I believe it would be Tuesday, July 7th. Mark, isn't that a scheduled council meeting? Uh, we, we generally um, do we have- We usually skip the fourth. We skip the fourth. Um, our, you're, you're correct, council member Karn, that would also fall on our council meeting. Again, it, they start their meetings typically at four o'clock. We could do that. Um, again, I, uh, I don't know that we've got a, a very heavy agenda at this point for, for that night, uh, but if it's something that you'd be interested in, I'm showing right now that we have nothing scheduled tentatively for the July 7th meeting. Let's, let's plan that then. I, yeah. Yeah, more, one last question, Mark. Is there, does, does that meeting have um, 
your coordination meeting with Lehigh City, is there any representation from their council in that meeting? No, it's a staff level meeting. And it's really, it's more just the kind of the nuts and bolts of, of um, we're doing projects together, you know, is there opportunities for us to work on zoning, different things together. And then typically we work with it at the staff level. And then once it's mature, we'll bring that item to you as councils to discuss those items. Okay, I support the seventh if we can make that work. Okay, yeah, I can do the seventh as well. Okay. What time are you saying at 4 p.m.? They typically start their work sessions at 4 p.m., but if that's too early for us, um, we could certainly they could do their other items and then just join us at, say, uh, 6 o'clock at the, at the North Marina, if that works for you as council. I would say earlier before the mosquitoes come out. Um, I, I was actually going to call mosquito abatement and have them spray the area the night before. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> No, I, I can make earlier work. I guess everyone just likes to go to like 8 p.m. on Tuesday nights. But. So, uh, again, if uh, is there a, a preference? Different, different demographic in Lehigh there. I can make any time work, <laughs> so I'm good. Mark, uh, my only suggestion is if we're going to do a, a, a joint dinner, let's make sure we pick a Saratoga restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, and I apologize for, for derailing a meeting, Mayor. We were just about to go into closed session. Okay, perfect. I'll entertain the motion for closed session. Move to go closed session. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Sorry. <laughs> okay. David, take us into closed session. I think we have to leave this meeting and go to another one, don't we? Yes. We do. We yeah. do. That is correct. So I will have this on the screen and wait for you to come on back. Okay.
Okay. We got everybody back. Oh. Looks like it. Okay. Okay. There's nothing else. We'll adjourn both meetings. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks. Thank you.